you by the mercies and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Remember that. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I'd like to use that fourth verse, and if I was getting ready to go out on the battlefield, I'd sure like to know what Weapons would be the best. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Everybody say mighty through God. Mighty through God God to the pulling down of strongholds. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the effect it has had upon our lives. As we stand in your holy presence, we recognize our help and our strength comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. Lead us, guide us, and direct our hearts this night. Help us to do thy will, Lord. Make our ministry a blessing here, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen. May be seated. God bless you. What are the strongholds that we are facing? What are those strongholds? We certainly face false doctrine. That's a stronghold. We are living in a day of witchcraft, the occultism, Satanism, cults, wickedness, spiritualism. All of these are strongholds of the enemy. And we will be facing them more and more. The Bible says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's an evident fact that we're going to have more of these pressures in the days that are ahead. What are your personal pressures that you are facing? What are some of your strong, the strongholds you need victory over? Is it sickness? Is it just daily pressures? Is it discouragement? I uh, would have to say that carnal weapons will never get the job done. Brother Sism asked me to speak at the retreat in a couple of weeks to the folks from Europe, and he asked me if I would speak on ministering in the power of the Spirit. I said, Brother Sism, I'm going to get up and speak about five minutes, and then I'm going to turn it to you. There's been too many times I have ministered and it was not in the power of the Spirit. I preached too many sermons, and they were just sermons, they were not messages. I have ministered through programs and through other things, and I have not ministered enough in the power of the Holy Spirit. But I have a great desire to do so. And if we're going to get the job done in these last days, we might as well make up our mind we're going to do it not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit and the power and the presence of God. I like what one writer said, If thy Spirit go not with us, don't lead us up. Amen. If Jesus goes with us, we can go anywhere. And so to have his spirit and his presence and his anointing is so vital, so important. 
not just on the mission field, but right here, the pressures that we are facing and the situations that we will be facing and dealing with in the days that are ahead, it's going to take a lot of the grace of God, a lot of the Spirit of God, a lot of the power of God. And I have, uh, I don't know uh, whether I'm, well, I do believe that I'm doing the right thing. Our church is praying and we're in fair, uh, uh, fasting prayer chain, believing God for miracles like we've never seen before. Hallelujah. I believe that's the will of God. I believe when the gospel is preached, we ought to see outstanding healings take place. It ought to be a, a normal thing. It should not be uh, out of the ordinary. It should be the normal every time we meet together. And I, I'm hungry for that. I desire that. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. And I believe the more uh, we get hungry for it, the more we desire it, the more we apply ourselves, Hallelujah. I believe the more that God is going to allow us to see it. Yes, Amen. I believe we're the church that he's coming for. Yes, sir. I don't think it's going to be a sickly church. I don't think the bride's going to be anemic or weak or sickly. I believe it's going to be strong and bold and beautiful and glorious without spot or blemish or any such thing. I want to be a part of that. Praise the Lord. I like to use David when he went out on the battlefield to fight his brethren, fight with his brethren, and uh, he came and saw a situation, and here was a giant that was boasting and saying, Give me a man. Send me a man. For 40 days he had done that, and every time he stuck his ugly head up and roared against God's people, they trembled, they fell back in their trenches, they were afraid. They, they did not have one man that was capable of going out there and, and fighting the giant. Saul was head and shoulders above anybody else, but Saul was not willing to go. He was afraid to go. And so David came to see his brethren and see how they were getting along. And about the time he drove up, he heard the challenge that was issued. Give us a man. Give me a man. If, if he defeats me, then the Philistines will be the servants of Israel. If I defeat him, then Israel will be the servant. And David couldn't understand why these men would not rise and face the challenge and and meet the enemy and defeat the enemy. He could not understand that. So he just uh, looked at his brother and he said, I will go. I will go. I'm willing to go. If nobody else will go, I will go. His brethren rebuked him. The first thing that David had to do to become the conqueror, the winner that he was, was to overcome the obstacle of his own brethren. It was his own brethren, his peer group that he had to overcome. He had to overlook the pressures from his own brethren. Why are you out here? Why did you leave those sheep? Did you come out here just because of the naughtiness of your own heart? You wanted to see the battle. Why are you here? David looked at those men and said, Is there not a cause? Hallelujah. I represent a cause. What are you fellows representing here? And I'm willing to go. So, he was willing to go because he represented a cause. And the reason that David could go was because he remembered that he had some victories back at home. Thank God. When you have victories at home, you can face the enemy on the battlefield. And when you get in a tight place, just try to remember those victories that you had at home. Hallelujah. He remembered a time when he had to fight a bear. He remembered a time that he fought a lion. And so he looked at this uh, Philistine that was the giant, nine feet and six inches tall. Uh, the, the spear, the head of the spear that he carried weighed 18 pounds. And uh, the armor that he wore, the coat of mail, weighed 55 pounds. And he was well equipped for the battle. David looked that situation over. It didn't make him any difference. 
He didn't look at that and uh, have a fearful heart about it all. He had faith and confidence in God because he remembered one time when the anointing came upon him and he waded right into a lion and he tore him apart and he felt the anointing another time and he slew the bear. So I want to tell you tonight, it's a wonderful thing to remember past victory. Amen. It's a good thing that you can encourage yourself in the Lord. David had to do that one time. I appreciate my brethren. I thank God for each one of you. And I love all of you. And I know that you'd help me if I was in need. But I'm telling you, there are some times in our experience when it's a fight all alone. We have to just find our own prayer closet, our prayer room, and we have to wait on God until we get that personal victory and encourage ourselves in the Lord. David did that one time at Ziklag when he came back from a battle and their buildings were burned to the ground and their wives and little ones had been taken captive and didn't know what to do. and. And that was trouble enough, but he began to hear his own men that were with him uh, talk about stoning David to death. David got to thinking in his heart, I can't win for losing. What am I going to do now? Everything is against me. The Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord. I believe he encouraged himself by simply remembering past victories, how God had been with him. I think he remembered uh, the promises of God. You see, there was a seven-year period in David's life from his anointing until his crowning. Seven long years he waited. The promise of God was, uh, David, you are going to reign as king over Israel. He just got to thinking, these fellows can't stone me. Uh, they're not going to kill me because I have the promise of God that Someday I'm going to be crowned. Someday I'm going to be king. I'm anointed now, but I'll be crowned after a while. That gave him a lot of faith for the present. Praise God. We're not crowned yet. We're only anointed, folks. But I'll tell you what, we've got some promises of God. Amen. The Bible tells us that we shall rule and reign with him. The Bible tells us that we're going to hear him say, well done, one of these days. The Bible tells us that we're going to have a glorious entrance into a better world than this. And that's not all. We will rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. And so when you remember past victories and remember the promises of God, it gives you a great incentive to face the present. And then, thirdly, David had to use the weapons that were best suited for the battle. There, Saul heard about David wanting to fight, and he was happy to find out. After 40 days, finally, there's somebody that's going to face the giant. So he called David in, and he said, Here, I want you to put my armor on. I want you to wear my armor. I want you to realize that this will help you. David dressed himself in Saul's armor, and it didn't fit. The history says that David started to go out on the battlefield, and that stuff got in his way. And he turned around and started back, and when he did, there was a great sigh that went up from his fellow soldiers, and they thought he was going back and giving up. But the truth of the matter is, he went back to King Saul and he said, You can have this coat. You can have this armor. You can have this shield. You can have this spear. I haven't proved these weapons. I don't know how to use these weapons. Amen. There's something I do know how to use. Hallelujah. Methods are good. Methods are all right. And programs are good. But I'll tell you, there's some things that we have proven already. There's some things that we know will work. There's some things we've already tried. They've been tried and tested and proven. And thank God they're at our disposal tonight. They're mighty through God to the reaching up and pulling down something. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it will work. I'm telling you, it will work. David just went down by the... 
by the brook and picked up five smooth stones. Amen. Five smooth stones. Reached in his shepherd bag and got a sling out. But he said, why did he get five stones? Somebody said it's spelled J-E-S-U-S. Because the God that he trusted, his name was going to be called Jesus. Somebody said it meant faith. F-A-I-T-H. Well, somebody else said that that giant had four other brothers, and he thought he might have to use one of those stones for each one of them. I don't know. But he got five. He didn't have to use but one of them. Hallelujah. But he used that that he had been using every day. Every day. I want to tell you folks, uh, this is not an hour to look for shortcuts. When we want God's blessing, we get right back into this Bible, this book, the basics, the fundamentals. When I don't want a move of God in my church, I can call uh, everything else in, knowing that the victory will come. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Next Sunday morning will mark 23 years that I have been in Houston. The second Sunday of November, I pulled in to into Houston with my wife and our two little girls, and I didn't exactly know uh, what what I was getting into, and I just knew that I was in the will of God. And I'd heard Brother Glass preach at the conference in Little Rock just a few days before, when David went out to fight the giant. Uh, all in the world he saw was a need. God showed him a need. There was nothing that forced him to go. Nobody required him to go. He just simply saw a need that he was willing to go. And that's what I saw in Houston. Those busy freeways and thousands of people that were lost. And God showed me a need. And I pulled in there and knew that I was in the will of God. And I got to laboring and got to working for the Lord and... They had given me a golden key and had a little tag on it to the pastor of Life Tabernacle. And I held it up that Sunday morning and I said, Now, here's a key that they gave me as pastor and and uh, they say it'll fit the door. I haven't tried it, don't know that I ever will. And I said, The key that I'm looking for is the key that will unlock the heart of God, that will bring revival to this city. And so I challenged our people that Sunday morning, and I got to praying and trying to believe God for revival, and got evangelists in, and we had good meetings, and the results were so small. I got so hungry for God one time that I just spent hours and hours every day in the church. I'd crawl on my hands and knees around the altar, pleading with God, and one morning, I'll never forget, I found a place where nobody could find me. There was a hole upstairs that would get into the attic, and and I lifted myself up through that attic, and I got in there, and, and I found me a prayer place. And the boards were laying on top of the rafters up there inside of that attic of the church. And it was summertime, and summertime in Houston is is a hot time. And uh, it was very uncomfortable. My position was on a slope. And I got up there and I said, well, thank God, I found a place nobody can find me and I'm going to pray. And I got to praying and wrestling with God in prayer. And one hour turned into two hours and two hours turned into three hours. And I heard my wife come through the church and she kept calling my name and she said, uh, Honey, he said, where are you? Uh, the temptation was to say, here I am. But I thought, no, I'm here for a purpose. And I've just got to ignore her call today. And she told me later on she could hear me groaning somewhere, and she didn't know what had happened to me, and she couldn't find me. And uh, But I just kept praying. I thought, I'm too close to what I want. I know that it comes that way. I was raised that way. I know what it took to have revival. I heard it in the middle of the night. I heard it early in the morning. I heard it through the daytime, Brother Glass. I heard those groanings and praying and crying and seeking after God. And then I saw the results that it would bring. And I knew that it would work. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but it's mighty through God. Hallelujah. 
So I stayed there for probably about eight or ten hours when I crawled out of that attic and dropped down to the floor. I didn't have a dry thread on my body. Clothes were all messed up. My hair was out of place. My face was swollen from crying and travailing. But, oh, I felt something here. I felt so good right here. I felt so good right here. Amen. I just knew that God was getting ready to do something. So that next Sunday night, uh, God filled two with the Holy Ghost. One was a man that had been tearing for 13 years. He is pastor in Pearland, Texas now, Brother Barnett. God filled him with the Holy Ghost and another little lady. And that was the beginning. The next few weeks we had uh, 55, 52 receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I know what it takes. There are no such thing as shortcuts for revival. I have to tell myself that every once in a while. There's no such thing as an easy way to have revival. Talent will not bring revival. Amen. Programs will not bring revival. But I know that fasting and praying and faith and confidence in God will bring a move of God. I know that. I've seen it work. These are proven weapons. Once, once in a while we're tempted to rely on substitutes. But then when we want results, we know we have to get right back to the basics, right back to the fundamentals. And that's what it takes. And then know that God is with you. If we know that He's with us, pray through, be free of fear. Have confidence in God. Be ready for anything. Don't give out. Don't give up. Don't give in. Just keep a holding on. Glory to God. Keep holding on. I like uh, to study the Apostle Paul also. I tell you, he is a man who had a lot of drive, a lot of zeal, a lot of determination. He was a man who fought the battle. Uh, if you ever go to Rome, be sure you go and see the little cell that they say he lived in the last two years of his life. Be sure you go see that. It will impress you, not with its beauty. It will impress you with, with the, the way it looks and the fact that there was not a window there. The fact that for two long years Paul was chained to a little bench there. And you'll see it there. It will impress you with the fact that there was nothing but straw on the floor in those days. For two long years, he didn't step outside. For two long years, they didn't clean that cell out. For two long years, he didn't even have a restroom to go to. And one time a day, they'd open a little opening and pitch a little piece of shrill, dried up meat, that was his food for two long years. And you'd think a man that hadn't seen the sunlight in two years, and a man that had not had hardly enough food to, to live on for two years, and a man who felt chained inside of a cell for two long years would be down and out and discouraged and would be saying, it's not fair, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But he wrote to those Philippians from that jail, and he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You're not down and out, Paul? No, I'm not down and out. You're not discouraged, Paul? No. No, I'm not discouraged. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, he said. And then he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Regardless of the circumstances, rejoice. And then he wrote to those Ephesians and he said, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, just keep on a standing. But be sure when you stand, you have your loins girt about with truth. Oh, friend, if ever a time we need to stand with the truth of God, it is now. God's not expecting the assemblies of God to do our work. I don't care how many is in the mission field you're going. They're not sent there to do your work. God didn't call the charismatics to do our work. He called us to do it because we love the truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Have your loins girt about with truth. Remember, you're going in with truth. And the truth will stand when this old world's on fire and this earth is wrapped in flame. The truth of God's Word will stand. Hallelujah. Then he said, put on the shield of faith. Glory. Put on the shield of faith. Amen. Why do you need the shield of faith? You can quench all, a double F, all the fiery darts of the enemy. Glory. No provision for the back. It's all right here. We're not going to turn around. We're not going to run. We're not going to give up. We're not going to give in. We're not going to give out. I'm going to keep the shield of faith. Amen. You don't know where I'm going, Brother Kilgore. You don't know what I'm going to face. That's all right. So what? I've got the shield of faith. The Bible said it would quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Not some of them, but all. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Tribulation's coming. That's all right. I've got on the shield of faith. Mark of the beast is coming. That's all right. So what? I've got on the shield of faith. Glory. Mark of the beast, the Antichrist. The tribulation, the battle of Armageddon's coming, so what? I've got on the shield of faith. This will work when nothing else will work, friends. Glory to God. Thank God. Thank God for the shield of faith. You can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Everything that comes against you. Job wore it. Amen. Paul wore it. That's why it's so important that we wear it. You put it on. Don't be afraid to wear it. Paul wrote from a prison cell and said, put on the shield of faith. And you're going to be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the enemy. Amen. Faith will work when nothing else will. This has been tried and tested and proven. And thank God it still works. Thank you. He wrote to the Colossians and he said, and he wrote from a prison cell, mind you, where he didn't see the ray of a sun, the flickering of a candle, and uh, chained to a, a little bench there. He wrote to the Colossians and he said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He said, I want you to know in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Oh, I'm glad he said that, aren't you? Praise the Lord. He wrote the second book of Timothy from that prison cell, and he said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Well, if he can write like that, it's time for us to take courage and realize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Remember, God has given you the power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me. And remember, don't just wound the enemy, kill him, cut his head off. That's what David did. He knocked him down, and then he pulled his sword out, and he sawed his head off. Came coming back uh, uh, from that battle back to the camp, pulling that head along with him. Here's the evidence. Amen. I defeated the enemy. I didn't just wound him. I got the best of it. We're fighting a defeated foe. He has power, but he doesn't have all power. He's mighty, but he's not almighty. He's present, but he's not omnipresent. 
Amen. And we have a name that's above every name. Thank God. And we can win the victory. We can overcome by the power of the name of Jesus. You come to me with a spear and a shield and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. I want you to know that name still works. That name is still effective. Amen. A group of little Pentecostal people were having an all-night prayer meeting out on the West Coast several years ago. And in the middle of the night, while they were praying, uh, all of a sudden a hideous-looking monster came right in the room there where they were. And, and it scared most of them half to death. They fell on the floor. They hid their faces. And uh, one little handmaiden of the Lord, who was full of the Holy Ghost, walked right up to that creature that demon, and said, uh, I command you to tell me who your name, who you are. He said, I'm the prince of this city, and you can't have it. She said, I command you in the name of Jesus to get out of here. And said, right before their eyes, he shrunk down to normal size and, and got out of there. Well, it's kind of a fantastic story, isn't it? I don't doubt it at all. Amen. One little handmaiden of the Lord full of the Holy Ghost using that name. Thank God in the strength of that name is able to reach up and pull down strongholds and cast down imagination and everything that exalts itself against the throne of God. Hallelujah. The man was flying his plane along one time and he heard a strange noise. And he recognized that it was a gnawing sound. Somehow a rodent had gotten on board and uh, was gnawing away at something back there. And he got to thinking, what if he gnaws through some of the lines that I have? Some of my vital instruments uh, would be affected and maybe cause a crash. And then he got to thinking that a rodent is an earthbound creature. He's not made for the heavens. So he just pulled the stick back and soared up high. The higher he went, the less noise he heard. Finally got up there so high, it was completely silent back there. He didn't hear the noise any longer. And then when he got to his destination and landed, got to looking back there and he found a great big dead rat. He got him into the atmosphere where he couldn't live, and that's where he died. Uh -huh. Amen. When the going gets rough and you don't know what else to do, just pull the stick back and start soaring up into the heavens. Hallelujah. Realize that we're not of this earth. We are made for a better world than this. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Hallelujah. To the pulling down of strongholds. And casting down imagination. Praise the Lord. I love him tonight, don't you? Amen, amen. Several years ago when we had our first conference in Salt Lake City, we were invited into the boardroom, the Latter-day Saints boardroom. And uh, seven or eight of us were in there and... They passed, uh, President Lee passed out the little cards of what they believe and their articles of faith. And, and I noticed down the line there that they baptized using the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He welcomed us. Very congenial, very friendly, very nice man. He welcomed us to the city. He said, you know, we have, we have a lot of religious conventions here. And, uh, we're, we're glad that people come here. We're, we just want to remind you, though, that you're part of the rest of the religious world, and the Mormon church stands alone, stands all by itself. And so I wasn't about to let him get by with that. I just waited for my turn, and finally, when it came my turn, I said, President Lee, I'd like for you to know we are a different religious group than any that you've ever had here. I said, in fact... We, uh, we believe in the doctrine of monotheism. We believe that there is only one God and his name is Jesus. And I said, furthermore, noticing your articles of faith here, 
you baptize using the titles by the Son and Holy Ghost, so that makes you a part of all the rest of the religious world. And this makes us different. We're separate. We're alone. We're all by ourselves. Amen. I said, we baptize uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Oh, he said, what are you going to do with Matthew 28 and 19? And I was glad he asked that. We're the only people in the world that know what to do with Matthew 28 and 19. Other people explain it away, make exceptions. And uh, But we take it just like it is. We believe in Matthew 28 now. And so I tried to explain to him what the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was. And uh, he said, oh, now that's just a play of words. And Brother Urshan said, President Lee, when you sign important documents for your church, do you sign it uh, president or do you have to put your name on it? Well, he said, to make it authentic, I have to put my name on it. He said, then, by the same token, when we go down to water baptism, unless we take the name and call the name and know what the name is, that does not make the baptism authentic. Amen. Amen. Well, he stood to his feet, and he was ready for us to go right away. (laughs) But thank God we have the truth. We are the people of the name. We're the people of the name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There are going to be those, Jesus said, in that day that are going to say, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in thy name. And in thy name we have cast out devils. And in thy name we have done many mighty works. And he said, then I am going to confess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And he said, you are workers of iniquity. The word iniquity means you have changed. You have changed my plan. You have done something with my plan. Oh, you use it in praying for the sick, and you used it in casting out devils, and you used it for many mighty works, but you changed my plan concerning my name. You are workers of iniquity because you did not accept my plan like it was. I'm glad we're a people that accept his plan. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. John 14 and 13, Jesus said, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Every time we pray for somebody who is sick, and we call upon that name. I try to picture the Father coming right back down in that name again. And the Son, He's glorified in the Son every time we call upon that wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. He should be glorified. And the sooner we get to the place that we're willing to glorify Him, in everything, and give Him praise and honor, and not try to take any up on ourselves, the quicker we're going to get the job done. Amen. I believe it. Thank God for that wonderful, precious, all-powerful name of Jesus. And the reason that name is so important was because of the one who wore that name. It wasn't the second blessed person of a so-called trinity. But it was God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. It was God who wore that name. Hallelujah. God was manifest in the flesh. There was a divine fusion of humanity with divinity. Once it's fused together, there's no separation, friend. That's like Jesus said that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That was a serpent of brass. Brass is made out of zinc and copper. Once it's melted together into brass, there is no chemical that can ever separate it and make it two particles again. It becomes one. And when you see the beautiful story of the Godhead, thank God, God manifest in the flesh and divinity fused with humanity, there is no way you can ever separate it again. 
Amen. What a wonderful, beautiful revelation. The mighty God in Christ uh, reconciling the world unto himself. No wonder when he spoke something happened. He spoke to an old dead rod and it lived. He spoke to a live tree and it died. He spoke to a calm sea and it was troubled. He spoke to a troubled sea and it was calm. When he spoke, something happened because the words that came from him, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Thank God when he spoke, something happened. When he spoke, something happened. When he spoke, something happened. And to think we have him dwelling with us. And he has given us his name. And we can use that name. And that weapon will pull the mighty force of heaven down to what we need. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When the officer sent the soldiers to get, get him and capture him with his own words, they got near to him. They heard him speak. They, they, they were so affected by his speech. They came back to the rulers, the officers. And the officer says, why didn't you bring him? All they could say was, Never man spake like this man. Oh, he was more than a man. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the Bible tells us in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. Hallelujah. You cannot separate his word from that flesh. His word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No wonder Paul could say, we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Sometime or another people are going to have to come to that revelation before they can be complete. I don't care how many miracles are being performed. I don't care how many converts they're getting. I don't care how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they're spending on buildings. They can only be complete in Him who is the head. In Him who is the head. Oh, He's the head of all things. I'll tell you, I get excited when I get to talking about the wonderful name of Jesus and the power of that name. Never man spake like this man. The reason is because it was God manifest in the flesh. He was so human, he got tired, but he was so divine, he could say, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He was so human that he could get hungry, but he was so divine, he could take that little basket of five loaves and two little fishes that Brother Glass preached about this morning, break it, the bread and the fish grow in his hand, feed the multitude, 5,000 men besides women and children. The best estimates must be around 20,000 people that he fed. Amen. He was so human that he was thirsty, but he was so divine he could say, whosoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I give him, he shall never thirst. Never thirst. There shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He was so human he had to pray, but he was so divine there was never a confession of sins. He was so human he went to sleep, but he was so divine he rebuked the winds and the waves and said, Peace be still, and there was a great calm. He was so human, he wept at the grave of a loved one. Jesus wept. But he was so divine, he could say, Roll the stone away. Martha said, Lord, if you had have been here, my brother would not have died, putting him as the God of the past. 
He said, oh, your brother shall live again. And she bypassed the day that we were living in and went to the future and said, I know he's going to live at the resurrection at the last day. But he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. They said if he hadn't called his name, graveyards would have burst open all over the world. That's why he called him by name. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. He was so human, he wanted to pay his taxes. Yet he was so divine, he could say, Peter, go catch a fish so we can pay our taxes. He knew exactly how many steps it was going to take to get to the edge of the water. And just when Peter was going to cast his hook in, the first fish that bit it, Opened his mouth, and there was money to pay the tax. Amen. He was so human, he could go to a funeral, but he was so divine, he could stop the procession and say, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. Hallelujah. He was so human that he could go to the land of Gadara and visit the men who were possessed of devils, legions of devils, but he was so divine, all he had to do was say one word, and that was go. And when he said it, friend, those legions came out of those men, went into a herd of swine, and were drowned in the deep of the sea. He was so human. The officers came to get him because they saw that he was just a man. But when he said, I am he, they fell to the ground. He was so divine. Amen. Isn't he a wonderful Savior? Aren't you glad you know him tonight? And in the days that are ahead, we're going to appreciate that name, and we're going to love that name. And we're going to depend upon that name, and we're going to rely upon that name like we never have before. I believe it. It's, it's going to become more valuable to us. We're going to see the value of it. And it's going to be in our hearts burning like a fire. And that's all we're going to have is just that name. That's all the early church had was that name. I think we're going to get back to that place. That's all we're going to have. But thank God for that name. Thank God for that name. Thank God for the name of Jesus. All of us, all of us at some time or another have had the opportunity to use that name. And I thought this evening of a time in, in my life, I first started preaching, cut loose from my job and out in California and was coming back to Texas to preach my first meeting. I was anxious to get there, anxious to get the preaching. And got out in the Mojave Desert, and in the middle of the night, or I say the middle of the night, about three or four o'clock in the morning, went to sleep, crossed that busy highway, and went up on the embankment on the other side. My car began to hit those big old rocks, and one rock forced the radiator into the fan, and other rocks forced the fenders up on the wheels of my car. When I went up on that embankment, I woke up to look and see a Greyhound bus coming. I didn't know how in the world I would ever escape it. All I had time to do was just say, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. There's something about that name. And miraculously, I'll never understand it, that car just swerved right in front of that bus and off on the other side. Well, came to a stop, and I got out of my car, and water was pouring out of the radiator. Fenders forced against the wheels, and air was going out of the tires. I didn't know what I was going to do here, out in the right out in the middle of the desert. Hallelujah. I knew the Lord was with me. I knew that. If you know He's with you, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? So a friend was with me, and I sent him on to town. We caught, okay, he caught a ride. I said, get a wrecker and come on back. After he left, I uh, 
could just see the rays of the sun. And I walked way out into the desert until so far away I looked back and my car just looked like a little speck there. And I made two little holes out there in the desert and stuck my knees in them. And I began to pray. And I prayed and I prayed. The sun came up and the perspiration was pouring off of Finally, I got the victory and I said, Lord, I'm willing to go preach if I have to walk. I went back to that automobile knowing that I was in the will of God. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's such a wonderful feeling to know you're in His will. That will give you a confidence when you are on your field of labor. Amen. Just knowing I'm in the will of God.